In this lecture, we're going to work through how federal privacy law protects email and other forms of electronic messaging. It's a lengthy lecture, but please stick with it. We're going to cover some of the most important material in the course. Before turning to the law, let's start with a quick technology recap. Let's suppose that Alice has an account with a particular email company. For want of creativity, I've just gone with Email Co. One thing Alice might do is log into her email account. Her access might be through a website, or it might be through a mail app. Alice might also draft an email, and she might save that draft on Email Co.'s servers. Eventually, she'll send that email off to its recipients. Alice also receives her email through Email Co. When a message arrives, it lands on Email Co.'s servers, where it's saved in her inbox. Eventually, Alice will check her inbox and retrieve that email. Of course, since storage is so cheap now, Alice will likely keep a copy of the opened email on Email Co.'s servers. So, there's a rough sketch of how email works. This lecture is all about the email provider. Specifically, it's about the procedures that allow government access to information that is exposed to the email provider. There are two broad categories to begin with. Some information is already held by an email company. That's retrospective collection. Other information hasn't yet arrived at the email company. That's prospective collection. Within the retrospective category, there are four buckets of information to think about. One is account information, a subscriber's name and physical address, for instance. Remember that we've already seen account information in the context of telephone provider subpoenas. Another bucket is session metadata. This is non-content information about a subscriber's logins and other usage of the email service itself. It includes the person's network address, when they connected to the email service, and how long they were connected to the mail service. The third bucket is message metadata. That's the message to and from addresses, the time it was sent, and the length. Note that there are two separate categories of metadata here. For telephones, by contrast, there was just one category of metadata. The final bucket is message content. That includes the subject line and the body of the email. So, there are our four buckets on the retrospective side. Over on the prospective side, we have the exact same metadata and content buckets. The only difference is that there is no account information bucket. As we saw with telephones, account information is just always treated as retrospective. Okay, that might look a little intimidating, but we're going to take it slowly and in parts. There are five topics I would like to work through on government access to those buckets of information. The first is the set of procedures that apply to prospective collection. They're very similar to the procedures for telephones. The next topic is retrospective collection under the Stored Communications Act. We'll look at two new types of court order under that statute. Our third topic is retrospective collection under the Fourth Amendment. Part of the Stored Communications Act is now widely considered unconstitutional, and we'll work through why that is and what the implications are. The fourth topic we'll address is particularity in warrants for stored communication. Courts sharply disagree on what particularity requires. Our last topic is a little data on electronic messaging and surveillance. So, let's start with prospective collection. Here's the table of prospective surveillance orders that we've already studied. Recall that there are two basic prospective orders, a pen trap order, and a wiretap order. A pen trap order has near rock bottom requirements, while a wiretap order 
has more requirements than even a warrant. The distinction in when they can be used is that a pen trap order covers dialing, routing, addressing, and signaling, often called DRAS. A wiretap order covers the content of communication. So, let's apply this law to email. Here are the three buckets of prospective email information. Courts have simply drawn a line between metadata and content. Both session and message metadata is DRAS. That information can be obtained with a pen trap order. Message content is, unsurprisingly, categorized as content. It can only be obtained prospectively with a wiretap order. So, that's it on prospective collection. The procedures for email are very similar to the procedures for phone calls. Now let's look at retrospective collection under the Stored Communications Act. And recall that the Stored Communications Act is the part of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act that covers all retrospective collection. It covers content, it covers metadata, and it covers account information. And there are three types of surveillance procedure that roughly map to each of those three types of information. We've already worked through the provider subpoena, which is the lowest level of surveillance procedure under the SCA. It provides access to account information and to session records. Once again, I think a Venn diagram can be helpful in keeping ECPA categories straight. So, we have our first category of account information and session records. The second category is just communications content. It's the same category we already saw under the Wiretap Act. Finally, there's a catch-all category. It applies to everything else. Each of these three categories is associated with a particular type of surveillance procedure. We've already seen that the first category is associated with a provider subpoena. The content category requires a warrant. These warrants are essentially the same as the search and seizure warrants we've already looked at. Finally, there's that catch-all category for non-content. It's associated with a special type of court order that's usually called a D order. They're called D orders just because they're defined in 18 U.S.C. section 2703, subsection D. An easy way to think about a D order is that it's a mini warrant. It works a lot like a warrant, but it requires a lesser showing from investigating officers. The text of 2703D is a bit of a mouthful. It says that investigators must demonstrate to a judge specific and articulable facts showing that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the information sought is relevant and material to an ongoing criminal investigation. The short version is that an application for a D-order must satisfy the reasonable, articulable suspicion standard. It's usually called RAS for short. The idea is that RAS fits into a hierarchy of three standards. The lowest tier is relevance. We've already talked about relevance in the context of subpoenas and pen trap orders. It's sometimes called mere relevance to emphasize just how little is required. The highest tier is probable cause. It's the standard we've already discussed in the context of warrants, and it's often abbreviated as PC. If you ever want to watch an absurd conversation, by the way, get a criminal lawyer and a software engineer talking about PC. It can take minutes before they realize they're talking about totally different subjects. Anyway, there's the hierarchy of standards for government access to information and how RAS fits in. The RAS standard comes from Terry against Ohio. That case established RAS as the required justification for a temporary stop. You've probably read about controversial stop and frisk policies in the news. Those are Terry stops. Getting pulled over in your car 
is also governed by the Terry standard. In the Terry case, and in its successors, the Supreme Court has done very little to clarify what reasonable, articulable suspicion means. About three points are well established. First, RAS requires less than probable cause. It's a lower standard. Second, RAS requires more than a hunch. It has to be based on some sort of objective evidence. Last, an uncorroborated anonymous tip is insufficient to establish RAS. Beyond those three principles, RAS is largely a fact-specific judgment call. So, enough about the RAS standard that applies to de-orders. Now let me make a few points about commonalities between de-orders and provider warrants under the Stored Communications Act. Both do not provide for notice to the target. That's different from a wiretap order. Both also do not provide a statutory suppression remedy. Violation of the Stored Communications Act is not enough to exclude evidence at a criminal trial. Third, both have subpoena-like properties. Let me explain that with some diagrams. In order to apply for a de-order, investigators file an affidavit and a proposed order. The judge then evaluates whether RAS has been established. If it has, she issues the de-order. The process for a provider warrant is very similar, except the standard is heightened. It's probable cause and particularity. Now, here's where things start to look different from a conventional warrant and start to look more subpoena-like. Police don't actually execute the warrant themselves. That is, they don't actually raid the email provider and seize data off the servers. Rather, they serve the warrant on the email provider. And the email provider then hands content data back. Or, in the case of a de-order, investigators serve the de-order, and they get non-content data back. All right, so now we've worked our way through the SCA. Let's apply the law to email. Here are the categories of retrospective information associated with email. The first group under the SCA is account information and session metadata. When we looked at the SCA's provisions on telephone records, we saw how both of these categories can be accessed with a provider subpoena. The exact same is true of email services. The next category is message metadata. It isn't covered by the SCA's subpoena provisions, but it also isn't content. That means it falls into the default category of a de-order. The last category is message content. It requires a provider warrant. This table puts together all the retrospective and prospective email surveillance procedures that we've covered. And this table puts together the differing standards for access to email information. Note that there's some inconsistency. The standard for prospective content is a jump up from the standard for retrospective content. That's understandable, since telephone surveillance works the same way. The standard for prospective message metadata, by contrast, is a step down from the standard from retrospective message metadata. Also, notice that the standard for retrospective message metadata is higher than the standard for retrospective telephone metadata. It's RAS instead of relevance. So, because of the way the SCA was drafted, email message metadata gets more protection than phone call metadata. Let me make one final point about the SCA's warrant requirement. There are two major exceptions where email content can be accessed with just a subpoena or a de-order. The first is for messages that are saved on a server for over 180 days. Those lose all their protection. The rough idea in the 1980s was that if someone left a message for half a year, it was probably abandoned. 
Nowadays, of course, we store years of email in the cloud. So there's one major exception. The second exception is for messages that have been opened. The Department of Justice has taken the position that once a message is opened, it is no longer in, quote, temporary, unquote, storage, and it is not a, quote, backup, unquote. The mandatory warrant provisions of the SCA only protect communications in temporary storage or backup communications. So DOJ has argued that open messages are not protected. Courts disagree on whether this is a valid exception. Some don't recognize it, some do recognize it, and some split the difference, only finding protection for open messages where a user has also downloaded a copy. There is one catch to using less than a warrant for communications content. The SCA does require notice in those scenarios. It can be delayed notice, but it does have to be eventually provided. Okay, so we've navigated the remainder of the Stored Communications Act. Those are the statutory protections for saved email. Now let's turn to how the Fourth Amendment applies to retrospective collection of email information. The old view was that all stored data was unprotected under the Fourth Amendment. That was simply because of the third party doctrine. As we saw earlier, the third party doctrine eliminates Fourth Amendment protection for information volunteered to a business. That includes account information, communications metadata, and communications content where the business is a recipient. The old view was that in order to store content with a business, you had to volunteer that content to the business. So, in the old view, storing data eliminated Fourth Amendment protection. In fact, one of the very purposes of ECBA, back in the 1980s, was to fill some of the privacy gaps created by the Third Party Doctrine. The belief that stored data wasn't protected by the Fourth Amendment is also why the SCA doesn't have a suppression remedy. Okay, so that's the old view. The new view of the Fourth Amendment is that stored content is protected. So, the content as recipient category, that is, where a person volunteers content to a company for the company to hold on to, slides over from the unprotected column to the protected column. The leading case in this area is United States against Warshak, handed down by a panel of the Sixth Circuit in 2010. So, just to be clear, email wasn't really constitutionally protected until about 2010. Good going judiciary. While Warshak is not formally binding in the other circuits, to my knowledge, no court has subsequently disagreed with the holding. Also, most popular online services now act as though they're covered by the Fourth Amendment, and they have threatened to litigate the issue if law enforcement were to get pushy. The facts of Warshak are pretty entertaining. The case involves a fraudulent mail enhancement product represented by a character named Smilin' Bob. And, oh, by the way, the owner's mom was one of his co-conspirators. I hope you'll find that reading enjoyable. In the Warshak case, federal investigators used a subpoena, and later a de-order, to access some of the business owner's email. Under the provisions of the SCA, it was old email, so a warrant wasn't required. The Sixth Circuit expressly held that the content of that email was protected by the Fourth Amendment. Therefore, the provisions of the SCA that allow access to email content with less than a warrant are unconstitutional. So that's what the Warshak case says. As for Warshak's rationale, it isn't entirely straightforward. The panel leaned extensively on a set of analogies. It said email content is a lot like telephone conversations, or a letter sent by snail mail. 
Those are both protected by the Fourth Amendment, and they require a warrant for government access. So, in effect, the panel said that email services are acting like a conduit. They're just like the phone company or the parcel carrier. Now, that analogy covers email between when it's sent and when it's read. But what about an email draft that hasn't yet been sent? Or email that's been opened and just saved on a server? Surely at that point, the email service isn't acting as a conduit anymore. And so the panel introduces another analogy, which is even more important. It says that email content is protected in the same way that a rented physical space is protected. A hotel room, for instance, or a storage locker. Under that analogy, the email service is the actual recipient of content. It's not at all acting as a conduit. At this point, I hope you're wondering how on earth the panel squared this last analogy with the third party doctrine. And to its credit, the panel did expressly note that its holding was in tension with the third party doctrine. And it gave a whopping four sentences of explanation. One distinction the panel drew is that stored content isn't a simple business record, like a financial statement or a phone bill. While that's certainly true, recall that the original rationales for the third party doctrine had nothing to do with how simple a record was. Another distinction that the panel drew is that stored email content isn't for a business's routine use. But, of course, email services make all sorts of routine uses of their customers' email. They build spam filters and recommendation engines, for instance, and they certainly target advertisements. A final distinction that the panel emphasized was that an email provider acts as a conduit. Again, that rationale might cover email from when it's sent to when it's received, but it really doesn't help with draft email or opened email. So, here are the Fourth Amendment takeaways that I hope to leave you with. Following Warshock, there is clear protection for email content stored with an email provider. The rationale for that protection, however, is ambiguous and seemingly inconsistent with the original rationales for the third party doctrine. I want to emphasize two practical implications of Warshock. First, it eliminates the SCA's major exceptions to when a warrant is required for email content. The exceptions for email older than 180 days and for opened email are no longer good law. Second, Warshock brings with it the Fourth Amendment exclusionary rule. If police access email without a warrant, that email can't be used as evidence in a criminal prosecution. As a coda to all this discussion about Warshock, recall the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule. Federal investigators accessed Warshock's email under the SCA, a statutory scheme that had not been seriously constitutionally questioned for decades. So, federal prosecutors were able to invoke the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule. Stephen Warshock made some very important law for future defendants, but his own emails could still be used against him. All right, so that's the status of stored email under the Fourth Amendment. Now let's turn to particularity. Remember that a warrant has to be particular about what's going to get searched or seized. In the context of wiretaps, recall, we saw a closely related requirement called minimization. The idea was that investigators had to quickly filter out irrelevant conversations. Courts sharply disagree on how the warrant particularity requirement applies to stored email. Some courts treat the particularity requirement a lot like wiretap minimization. They'll issue a warrant for email, but only if it's filtered in some way, such as by particular times, or particular contacts, or particular keywords. Some of those judges expect the email services themselves to do the filtering, while others craft a minimization procedure 
that they require the police to follow. Another view, held by some other courts, is that the particularity requirement is much less demanding. Those judges would allow police access to all of an email account's content. And then, maybe later, if the police hang on to some emails that are totally irrelevant to their investigation, then maybe there would be a Fourth Amendment violation. So, to put that all more succinctly, some courts impose clear scope protections in advance, while other courts would impose only vague scope protections after the fact. All right, that's all I wanted to say about particularity. The last subject is just a little data on government access to email. Quite a few technology companies now provide public statistics on government requests for data. Google was one of the first to provide this sort of transparency report, and their reports go into an especially helpful level of detail. So, since there is no government report, I'm going to use Google's data. Here's the trend in U.S. government requests over the past five years. They've grown by nearly four times. And here's the breakdown of the different types of government process that have been served on Google. Subpoenas are, once again, the most popular tool. Interestingly, warrants are used much more often than de-orders, even though de-orders are easier to get. The conventional wisdom is that by the time investigators have reasonable, articulable suspicion for a de-order, they likely already have probable cause. So if investigators are going to ask a judge for permission, they might as well get the full warrant. That brings to a close the data that I wanted to share and the material on government access to email. I've updated the table of retrospective surveillance orders, and we now have the complete picture. In the next lecture, I'm going to very quickly explain how other sorts of online services are covered by the SCA.